Horizontal comedy now on BBC Two from Victor Lewis Smith. so far. <laughs> We've been playing a compilation of very dull programs into the patient's brain. And for some reason, they've come out transformed. Brilliant. Yes. Faster. We must get him into surgery at once. Edison medicine. Oh, dear. I've just brought something to cheer you up. The DG has decided he must be terminated. So that's the story so far. Things are looking pretty grim, I'm afraid. Medical science can do no more. His life is drawing peacefully to a close. The sands of time are slipping away. So why don't we pull in the plug? Put it this way. By midday, you'll be a single woman. I see. Well, I better contact the newspapers so they can prepare the obituaries. Make sure they get him in here. Goodbye magazine. That's new, isn't it? The cameras are invited in to meet the celebrities at the very moment they meet their maker. Hmm. The Manson family invite us into their beautiful home. Hmm. Whose entrails are these? Find out on page 17. I've been meaning to ask you about your husband's religion so that we can give him the last rites. Otherwise, he just gets the standard visit from the TV vicar. Hello. Ah. Hello. Tonight, I want to talk to you about original sin. What does that simple phrase really mean? Well, Mr. Taylor of Ipswich has sent me a picture of a very original sin indeed, for which he wins ten pounds. Hello. Hello. We have to face facts. The end is inevitable. It's only a question of... Timing. Quite so. Has it just been done this corridor before? Yes, it's the cuts. Um, you wouldn't consider donating his bits to medical science, would you? It could make his fellow human beings somehow more complete. That would be against everything that he believes in. Yeah, let's do it. Did he ever make his last wishes known? We did discuss it. As I remember, he said... I said, 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 when I die, I'm not going to spend a fortune on an expensive burial. Yes. I've instructed the executor of my will yes. to perform the ultimate posthumous practical joke. Yes. I've asked him to chop me up into little bits. Yes. I've asked him to wrap me in cling film. Yes. And I've asked him to... pieces in supermarket freezer compartments the length and breadth of Britain 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 Rump in Aberdeen earlobes in Birmingham testicles in Worthing delicatessens would become indelicatessens overnight and that way even though I'd be dead 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 still leave a nasty taste in people's mouths at dinner parties for months. Go on, why not have a loin of me this weekend with some turnips? You'd love me with some turnips. Or why not try new southern style recipe me? Made from a blend of 11 different herbs and... Spicy! We delve into the secret life of television. Tonight, part 45, Extinct Species. Extinct television species number one... With a yoink, Sally Ho, yo ho! The black and white minstrel show. No matter how many archive programs the BBC transmits, one thing is certain. They will never, never, never repeat the Black and White Minstrel Show. Lose his paw.
relaxed in the 1970s after accusations of offensiveness, the performers complained bitterly that their true intentions have been completely misunderstood by white middle-class liberals. I've said this time and time again. The reason we were on telly was to show that Enoch was right. I mean, it took us 15 years to prove to the BBC what the audience had suspected all along, that they'd been infiltrated by the entire Finchley Central branch of the British National Party. I mean, thick or what? Extinct television species number two, Hogmanay programs. Transmitted live from Scotland, New Year's Eve television used to mean one thing only. Inebriated, unfunny, incomprehensible, loudmouthed, sporn wearing, untalented, argumentative, and that was just the continuity announcer welcoming you to four hours of light entertainment Scottish style. <laughs> Although this heavy entertainment show was officially scrapped in the 1980s for technical reasons, it was crap. You can still see shows like it today. Just hang around King's Cross Station just before an overnight train to Aberdeen departs and you'll find it's still being made. <laughs> Only now they don't bother with cameras. Oh, the new... Extinct television species number three, weirdos playing table tennis. In the 1960s, whenever TV wanted to show that weirdos were just like the rest of us, really, they showed them playing table tennis. Mal's Red Guards, normal. Prisoners, normal. Violent teenage criminals, oh, very normal. Nudists, quite normal. Quite, quite normal. Oh, dear. If only Pol Pot had played a bit more table tennis. Part four. Television interlude films. The Angelfish. The Herring Plant. And the windmill. Not forgetting the all action. Watching paint dry. And the not at all dull ditch water. But in the 1970s, attempts were made to make the interludes more exciting. If you look closely, you can still see the original kitten and the ball of wool with which the interlude began. But things somehow got out of hand. The interlude reached its nadir with... Liver transplant! This had to be withdrawn after only one showing. The liver had an exclusive contract with Anglia Television, you see. Just get on to the next picture. Please, please. Of course, we could always revive the white and black minstrel show in a politically acceptable form. There you are, that's all right. The white and black minstrel show. I'm in love. Have you heard this type of music? Ha, 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 ha. It is called process music. Ha, 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 ha. There's no need to learn composing. Simply fail a music CSE. <laughs> Michael Nyman, Philip Glass, both write this crap which rarely changes. Keep, 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 keep. But the thing I really hate is when it starts to arpeggiate. Or moves from the minor into the major. Laughing all the way to the bank. Ha, 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 ha. They're laughing all the way to the bank. Ha, 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 ha. this kind of music it is called world music find a triber in note and poor who knows sod all about copyright law make a tape for 20 hours offer them a bunch of flowers you're welcome sell the record make a packet it's the latest third world racket laughing all the way to the bank <laughs> We're laughing all the way to the bank. <laughs> hmm. Have you heard this kind of music? It is called techno music. Keyboards that are electronic churn out sounds that sound moronic. Press a button, let it run. Half an hour later, your album's done. Laughing all the way to the bank. Ha 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 ha. We're laughing all the way to the bank. Ha 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 ha. Who pulled out the plug? I didn't. There are some weirdos in here. What happened to him? Asthma attack. Asthma attack? Yeah. He was attacked by three asthmatics. Where's me boy? Your boy? You're not much alike. People say that. 
Why run the bloody wang, but he didn't give a toss for contemporary dance. Where is he then? Do you want to pay your last respects? Yes. This way. And you've got fishy eyes. Thanks a lot. Kith and Kin, the House of Windsor. For decades, reporters have tried to penetrate the royal cloak of secrecy. Yet, the biggest royal secret of all has remained shrouded in mystery. Until now. <coughs> Historians have chronicled the birth of two children to George VI. Elizabeth, the dog-loving princess, never happier than when sitting on a horse. <laughs> and Margaret, teetotal, strict, virginal, and a fine art connoisseur, never happier than when sitting on a Chippendale. I mean, the chair, you filthy-minded swine. Mm. Thank you. Elizabeth and Margaret Winter, the royal sisters, but no mention is ever made of their younger sister, Barbara Windsor. Why? Because tragically, Barbara was born very common indeed. Profoundly shocked that a bike should have been born into the royal lineage, palace advisers insisted that Barbara's very existence was to be kept top secret. <laughs> While Elizabeth and Margaret, who were born posh, went out on the town dancing the night away at Belgravia ballrooms. Barbara, who was not born posh, was left alone in the palace scullery where she passed the time learning to dance like Fred Astaire, the famous firefighting tap dancer with the adenoid problems. Fred Astaire, 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 Fred Astaire. The beloved Queen Mother, avid dipper of the royal head into the royal bucket of vinegar every day to make the royal face shrivel up and the royal teeth go yellow, ordered Barbara into exile. Penniless, she left the palace by the tradesman's entrance and sought work at another palace, the Palace Theatre. Adopting the stage name Babs Windsor, nobody realised that the glamorous, high-kicking member of the chorus line was, in fact, none other than the Queen's sister dramatic chord. Babs Windsor, sister of Elizabeth, was cast out by her own people. So she sought refuge amongst the friendly cockney folk in the East End. As the young pretender to the throne, she established a rival court at her estate, a council estate in Dalston, which would one day become known as Royal Dalston. It was at this time that she married King Kevin. God help us. <laughs> Years passed. In her 1982 New Year's Honours list, Queen Barbara dubbed the eminent statesman Arthur Mullard both an Earl and an OBE, thus making him the first ever earlobe. Queen Babs's loyal subjects were heartened to see that the royal family retained the traditional Windsor love of dogs. Soon, a royal brigade of guards was formed, and plans were laid to restore Queen Babs to the Windsor throne by force. Royal historian Melvin Briggs takes up the story. Elizabeth sought a reconciliation and decided to phone her sister. Hello, who's speaking? This is the Queen speaking from Bristol. You can shut your mouth, you old-faced old bag! Thank you. It was at this stage that Sir Ronald Cray and his twin brother tried to assassinate the Queen Mother at a tiny East End pub, The Blind Beggar. Four billion cockiness witnessed the event, which is why any taxi driver you ever meet will tell you that he was there when it happened. Oh, there they are, they are, they are all fitted into a small pub like that, I just don't know. Thank you. No doubt, like me, you're starting to realise why we shunted this kith and kin into the last programme. Put it this way, rearrange the following words. Horse, uh, dead... Flogging. Thank you! Doctor. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not a doctor. I'm a consultant. You call me Mr. As in Mr. Whippy? Or Mr. Softy? What you're going to do will be murder. It's either his neck or mine. I've been promised a one way ticket out of here if I play ball. I didn't know you played ball. Well, I have to pull out the plug. It's not just playing ball. <laughs> Uh-oh. Bronchial problems? If you smoke, you're gonna need more than Daz to shift those spades. Let's face it, with lungs like yours, you're a dead man which is why you should carry one of these at all times. That's right, 
If you're a heavy smoker, then why not pick up a Tar Domus cup from your public library? Carry it with you at all times, and when you inevitably succumb to a pulmonary disorder or a touch of cancer, the small print on the card will allow us to remove the tar from your lungs and use it to tarmac Adam the new Smokers Memorial Motorway, which stretches from Land's End to John O'Groats. As a mark of respect, the entire hard shoulder will be decorated with commemorative plaques giving full details of your sacrifice to passers-by. Dead people, like Fred Quibble, who smoked 200 capstan full strength every day for 50 years. The contents of his lungs were used to tarmac this three-foot section of motorway. The Tar Donor Card. Don't just have a bypass, be a bypass. A couple of months ago, a friend of mine, completely out of the blue, won a free meal in a place in North London. Unfortunately, there was a catch. It turned out to be a barium meal, served up in the radiotherapy ward down at his local hospital. He'd only gone to outpatients in the first place because an eyelash got caught under his lid. You know it is, no one at home to remove it. Anyway, during the examination, he coughed. Well, that was it. Within minutes, the pump hit his arm, and after an hour, the doctor started playing Matthew Corbett, and my mate took on the role of Sutty. By the end of the day, he's in a hospital bed looking like Spaghetti Junction. It turned out that Jesus wanted him for a Sunday. Seemed reasonable enough on the Blessed Redeemer's part. What with the summer we've been having, we could do with a few more sunbeams. We joked about it at first, especially about the relatives who turned up and whispered, don't worry, cancer isn't a word to be afraid of these days. It's funny, isn't it, how that's only ever said by extremely well people as they congregate around the hospital bed of someone who's recently been diagnosed in a thumbs-down sort of way. They're quite right. No one in their right mind should be afraid of cancer as a word. But cancer as a malignant growth spreading like wildfire through the lymphatic system, that's another matter. And they say, they can do miracles these days. Like hell they can. They can stuff you full of chemicals and make your hair fall out and your piss turn brown, but kill you. How we laughed in the face of death. It only got worse, that is, and the laughter became less frequent. I was laughing in the face of death from two to three every afternoon and then going on to the pub for a pint. But death was staring at him 24 hours a day and no matter how much he laughed in his face, it never cracked a smile in return until the final days when we stopped laughing altogether and death finally started to loosen up and shy itself, piling on every last indignity, pneumonia, amnesia, fever, double incontinence and best of all, the pints of white fluid gushing out of his nose in the final hour. It's strange seeing someone who only a few months ago was frog marched out of a restaurant for shouting, the only mussels and crabs in this place are on the waitresses. Now, in a box without a handle on the inside and with the lid screwed down. I tell you, it ruined my morning, he did. It's self, self, self with some people.
didn't bring anything to cheer you up. There didn't seem to be much point. <sighs> so this is it then. And it's so hard to find the words, isn't it? Very hard. But don't worry about me. I'll struggle through. <laughs> Your dress gets any shorter, I can see what you've had for dinner. I'm your father-in-law. We never met, cause I'm so disgusting. I'm next to Ken. Where's his stuff? Christ, is that all he's got? Hardly cover the cab fare. Yeah, I'll have that. Listen, sizzle chest. What about his money? He wanted me to have it. For sentimental reasons. Can I be his walkman? Piss off. It's mine. <laughs> Christ, not much of a hole. Hardly worth the bother. Of course, I've been bleeding dubbed again. For 40 years I've been landed with his voice. Outrageous. Don't even get a sniff at Terence Rattigan anymore. The magical voice of Frank Sinatra, still sounding every inch as magnificent today as ever. And to celebrate his 95th birthday, Old Blue Eyes has recorded his greatest hits on a brand new album. 60 glorious minutes that movingly chronicle one man's rendezvous with age-related amnesia. I've got you under my house. I've got you deep into Mickey Mouse. I want what? And who could forget? Don't dish the dirt, cause my hanky is damp. That's why, that's why the jerk bill is a lamp. Ramp. Map. Pork. Wig. Donkey, finger, string best. Who could forget? Frank could. Yes, this is Mr. Sinatra. So far gone, he can't find his own ass with his hands. Once you bake me low pence, I will marry Rin Tin Tin. End of the bin. Hershey bar and winner for that well. Medication 14 times a day. Yes, the immaculate phrasing, the gloriously rich vocal artistry, the magnificent delivery, all gone on this album of 20 unforgettable songs, completely forgotten. What? Thank you, Home Secretary. Now, the growing problem of homelessness in our inner cities. Over now to someone looking into a monitor who's watching someone on a monitor who's looking at someone else on a monitor, who's also watching someone on a monitor. <laughs> Cheers. You bet we're deeply concerned about the uh, problem of homelessness. Um, that is why this government is proposing to privatise the homeless. Privatise the homeless? That's a, that's a radical new concept. Radical and exciting, yes. Um, you see, under our new scheme, mm -hmm. uh, thousands of hermetically sealable cardboard boxes will be produced, uh, just like this prototype. Mm -hmm. As you can see, uh, there's plenty of room inside for one person, uh, if they curl up tightly into a ball. And it won't cost you, the taxpayer, a penny, because each one will be sponsored by a major distillery mm -hmm. and placed in a prime location mm -hmm. with uh, a prominent logo uh, on the side. And what are living conditions like? Can we see inside? Uh, by all means. They're uh, comfortable, spacious, uh, lined with biodegradable plastic. In a word, snug. But here is the best feature. Each box is fitted with this thermocoupled bimetallic strip here, <laughs> yeah. um, which is connected to an incendiary device here in the base. Now. When the internal temperature drops, indicating that there's been a death in the box, the whole caboodle instantly cremates itself, leaving nothing behind but a few ounces of carbon powder. No post-mortem, no cost to the state, no strain on the housing stock, no pollution of the environment. <laughs> it's 
it's all in our manifesto. Yes. Oh, They're out to get me, you know. But I'm too clever. I'm far too clever. Thank you, Minister. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly I find myself back in a taxi being driven through my own veins and giblets. My health suffering from passive bigotry caused by the big ignorant cabbie in the front seat. Still, we're well into episode six, so this is probably the very last time I shall use this narrative linking device. Please, yeah. oh, 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 careful, careful. Look, careful. Oh, look, Sir Lordy, sorry about all the skiddy oh. gub. We're on your target. It had half coated. Yeah, yeah, we're just aiming for the gap in my front teeth. Chief. I can see the light. I can see the light. light. Yeah, you brought your Christmas presents yet, gub, have you? No, no. I never bother. Bother? You no, know, I just go down to the local pottery and I ask for some smashed up broken bits from the kiln. Smashed? Then I wrap them up and write Wedgwood on the box. Wedgwood? And then I post them and sit back and wait for the phone call. Phone calls? Thank you for your lovely Wedgwood fire. Oh, so sad it got smashed by the postman. Oh, you cow son, gub. What? Lord will spite you with his wrath for your wickedness, he will. Oh, yeah, right. Anyway, hold tight. We're about to hit daylight. We're passing through your lips, Governor. We're passing through your lips. Watch this. Someone's been trying to feed you a blackcurrant sweetie, stupid fools. You might have choked. Oh, it's shaped like a tiny taxi. Whatever next. I like black currant. <laughs> I'll have it. My psyche has just been mistaken for a black currant bonbon. It's not dignified, I must lash out. Lash. Oh, hello. That's Flores, is it? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, excuse my hushed voice. I'm in the chapel of rest at the moment. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Oh, God bless you. Um, Are you wanting to deliver flowers? A spray. I want a spray. Yes. And when is it for? Sorry, you have to excuse me. I'm slightly distraught. Yes. It's my grandfather. I'm in the chapel of rest at the moment with him. He's next to me now, so you can understand it's not yes. a... Can you pay by credit card? Uh, uh, hold on a second. I'll just go through his top pocket. Could you hold on? Yes. Martha, go down his clothes when you pull out his credit cards. Bear with me, please, would you? Mm -hmm. now, pull his shroud up and rip his trousers at the back. That's right, is it there? Give it here, come on, here, hand it here. Hello. Hello. Sorry, we had to cut it out. What, um, do you take American Express? We do. Right. Would you like the details? Well, I'd need to take the number. Right, I'll give Thanks. you that now, then. 3742. Yeah, the expiry date, please. What do you...? The expiry date. Yesterday. Sorry? What do you think of the expiry date? I'm sorry, dear, what were you saying, expiry date? I'm, I'm distraught. Thing is, we're not in a real chapel of rest at all. We're in a... We're in a boarding house in Crawley. Hello? Are you still there? Would you like to ring back? He's curling up at the ends. Is he? Oh, dear. I think you'd better ring back. His ears are off. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Four plugs, four of us. We'll never know which of us disconnected him. We'll all pull together. Right. So which one is my plug? Looks like this will be my first murder case, and I've got insider information. Could be a sniff at the sergeant's desk. How small and insignificant we are in the face of death. How puny are our dreams. As death beckoned, I had an out-of-body Shirley MacLaine sort of experience. I saw a brilliant white light and went towards it. Everything was peaceful, angelic harps were playing. <laughs> Suddenly, I saw my earthly friends and relatives who had passed beyond the veil gesturing towards me and calling out to me. I realised they were telling me that it was not yet time for me to leave the physical level. I returned and re-entered my earthly form. On the count of three. Three. 